you're watching GMT on BBC World News. I'm Lucy Hawkins. Our top stories, defiance in Hong Kong. Democracy protests shut down many parts of the city. Riot police have been pulled back, but demonstrators are refusing to leave. Beijing warns it won't tolerate any external support for what it calls illegal movements. A change at the top in Afghanistan. Ashraf Ghani is sworn in as president under a power-sharing deal with his rival Abdullah Abdullah. Japan's second highest volcano continues to unleash dangerous gases and ash. The hunt for more than 30 missing hikers is suspended. What's on the program? Aaron joins us. Looking at the market and business reaction mm. to those protests in Hong Kong, Aaron. Oh, Lucy, it has the sixth largest stock market in the world, the second largest in Asia, and certainly one of the biggest hubs for foreign exchange. So far, these protests have shut down banks, and the Hong Kong stock market has fallen. So we're going to take a look at how this city can keep its status as one of the top global financial centres. It's midday here in London, 7am in Washington and 7pm in Hong Kong, where pro-democracy protesters are digging their heels in and refusing to be moved. They're rallying against plans by Beijing to vet candidates for Hong Kong's 2017 leadership elections. Thousands now are fanned out across the city, choking the streets and shutting down crucial business hubs. We understand about 3,000 people have blocked a major road in Mong Kok as 1,000 people faced off against police in the busy shopping district of Causeway Bay. Activists camping overnight as well in Hong Kong's financial district and today police have been trying to disperse protesters around government buildings in the city. China has said it won't tolerate any external support for what it calls illegal movements. That's a clear warning to other countries. Our China editor, Kat Gracie, has been to the heart of the protests. This is a working day in what's normally one of the most orderly and the most money orientated cities in the world. Uh, but as you can see, the crowds are back to support their democracy movement. The numbers ebb and flow, more here today than there were by daylight yesterday, but fewer than overnight. It's a fairly relaxed atmosphere as you can see, um, everyone just sitting down and enjoying themselves. But there are people preparing the supplies in case the riot police come back with tear gas later, preparing the towels and the masks and the water. Of course, this is the heart of the business and government district. Government headquarters there, the parliament building there, behind the government headquarters, the Chinese People's Liberation Army headquarters. And all eyes currently on Beijing, a sense of unease about what their next step will be. But I'm also interested to understand what the financial workers of Hong Kong feel about this. Because, of course, Beijing has said that one of the things against a big civil disobedience protest like this is that it'll damage Hong Kong's prosperity. So what do the bankers, what do the insurers, what do all the people who work for them, what do they feel about this democracy protest? I think it's just the government trying to threaten us by saying uh, the, the financial market is crashing down. I think it's very peaceful. Yeah, and uh, I'm so sad because the police has to do this way in, uh, to the people. Yeah, I'm very disappointed about the government. I mean, these demonstrations are far more important than any sort of day's work. Uh, this is about the long-term future of Hong Kong, freedom of speech, uh, about being a little bit different to mainland China. Just some of the voices in the financial sector here today. People coming to work, coming out of work at lunchtime. I've talked to a lot of them. And what is striking is that every single one of them supports the aims of these students. While we've been talking, the numbers down there on the streets are growing. It looks like it's going to be a long day and night ahead. Our China editor, Carrie Gracie, there in Hong Kong. So who are the protesters and how did it all start? Occupy Central has been promising to protest for months if Beijing's reforms didn't include democratic elections that meet international standards. But ongoing student-led demonstrations at government headquarters have meant that Occupy Central has brought its protest plans forward. The movement is supported by many political parties in Hong Kong who have become galvanised since August when China ruled on how elections would be conducted. 
Let's take you to Hong Kong. We can speak to filmmaker and protester Edwin Lee, whose images right now of these protests are being broadcast throughout the world on television and social media. Edwin, thanks very much for being with us here on GMT. You've been out on the streets. What's the mood amongst protesters as night falls in Hong Kong? Uh, the mood now has uh, been a bit died down now because it's, it was a long day and night for us yesterday. Um, right now, uh, I'm in the area of Mong Kok now, which is the other kind of protest district. And everyone's kind of chilled out right now because the police have sort of taken a step back and have sent in police negotiators to try and encourage the people to leave. And in that motif, uh, what I've seen, a, a lot of people have been camped out right there. So right now the police are taking a step back and the protesters there are also just kind of playing a waiting game with them right now. How long are protesters prepared to stay, Edwin? Uh, I think everyone has their own kind of um, time limit and agenda. But it seems, uh, from what I've seen, the uh, enthusiasm has been great. Uh, the support has been great as well. So it seems um, they're in there f for as long as they can hold that, really. We're seeing pictures that you shot uh, yesterday on the screen at the moment. Beijing, it doesn't seem, is going to give in, though. Is there some kind of compromise here? I think the, um, the agreement that they gave out was their kind of compromise already, and it's something that a lot of these protesters and I will not accept because it's not universal, full universal suffrage. Um, I think right now the idea for these protests is to uh, put back uh, more favorable um, agreements back on the table and encourage the Hong Kong government to go back to the Chinese government and sort of you know, express what we really want because there's no real kind of direct dialogue between us and the Chinese government. It's always going to be through the Hong Kong government, so that's what we're trying to encourage them to do. Beijing is promising that the candidates that they vet will be representative. Do you just simply not believe Beijing? Um, I mean, it's their word against ours, really. I mean, um, but I mean, the more important thing is the, it's the fact that the the candidate that they will nominate is nominated by a very small fraction of people. It's twelve hundred people, who by and large are supporters of the Chinese government. So, you know, if you tell that to me, like, would you believe that? So, we, we, most of us won't. Edwin, thanks for sharing your thoughts with us. Edwin Lee, they're a filmmaker. You saw his pictures on the screen a moment ago. Let's take you to our correspondent, Juliana Liu, who's been monitoring events all day from Hong Kong. Juliana, just hearing from one of the protesters there that things are fairly calm out on the streets, a, a sort of reasonably amicable mood amongst the protesters. But are the numbers swelling? Uh, yes, that's right. The numbers are swelling. Uh, I had joined uh, one of the occupations at Admiralty, and the crowd started gathering uh, well before the lunch hour, which is unusual here. Uh, and by the time I left, it, it became very clear that the crowd uh, today, uh, this evening, is much bigger than the one uh, from yesterday. And the mood uh, is perhaps a bit more mellow because, uh, in part, the policing seems to be much more subtle uh, today. Uh, by this time uh, yesterday, the police had already fired several rounds of tear gas, which really escalated the situation. Uh, that hasn't been the case today. Perhaps there is a recognition that perhaps uh, some of the methods employed uh, yesterday were perhaps a bit uh, heavy-handed. Juliana, thanks so much for updating us from Hong Kong. Aaron's going to have more on the financial implications of all of this later in the program. We've also got lots more for you on the website. We've got a live page there for you, just updating you minute by minute on everything that is happening uh, in Hong Kong. And later here on GMT, we're going to be talking about Beijing's reaction to this. Also, mainland Chinese, what information they can access in terms of what's going on in Hong Kong. So do stay with us as we continue to keep you right up to date with those pro-democracy protests in Hong Kong. President Obama has acknowledged that America's intelligence agencies underestimated the threat posed by Islamic State extremists in Syria and overestimated the capabilities of the Iraqi army. This as Iraqi government forces battle Islamic State militants outside the capital Baghdad. Let's take you to our chief international correspondent, Lee Doucette, who joins us now from Baghdad. Lee, what's happening today? Well, we've been getting uh, reports uh, from last night that there had been heavy fighting in an area about 20 miles west 
of Baghdad in, in Anbar province. Uh, the Islamic State fighters, so-called, are in control of large parts of Anbar, including uh, Fallujah. We had reports that an area close uh, to that city, Amarate Fallujah, there was uh, clashes between uh, tribal fighters, the Iraqi army against uh, the IS, and the Iraqi Air Force had to be called in in order to repel the attack. We get reports every few days of key battles very close to Baghdad, and yesterday we were able to visit what's called a protective belt around the capital, where we traveled with two of the sheikhs who were in, uh, in charge with helping to, to defend the, the belt of Baghdad, and they showed us how in some areas the IS fighters are as close as about five miles away, so that is dangerously close to Baghdad. Liz, thanks for that. Let's take you to our correspondent Mark Lowen, who joins us now from Mershid Panah on Turkey's border with Syria. Uh, Mark, what are refugees who are escaping these airstrikes telling you? Well, Lucy, there's quite a lot of tension this morning uh, on the border here with Syria, partly because two pretty loud uh, explosions were heard uh, an hour or so ago. They were mortars which appear to have landed here in Turkish territory itself. These were uh, big ISIS mortars that, uh, that, that landed here, big uh, plumes of black smoke seen billowing out from the explosions. Uh, and so uh, a lot of tension from that. That was, that, was pretty, that was extremely close to where we were standing. But added to that, you've got the tension between the Turkish government and the Kurds, because uh, what has happened today is that a lot of Kurds, hundreds of Kurds, have, have, have rallied here from all across Turkey, descending on this border point, trying to cross over the border into Syria, many of them to try to fight with the Kurdish militia. But the Turkish military police block that main road up to the border with uh, tanks, with armoured vehicles, to stop them crossing over. They had to just push them back with uh, tear gas and water cannon. There was exchange of stones between the Kurds and the Turkish police. Turkey fears that if they cross over into Syria, that they could join the Kurdish militia on the other side, which is allied with Kurdish fighters here in Turkey, and could launch attacks on Turkish territory. So all of this showing Turkey's twin challenge, how vulnerable this country is at the moment. It has the, the uh, attacks from Islamic State, two mortars landing on its territory this morning, and the tension with the Kurds. Uh, what the Kurds are saying is that they should be seen not as the enemy, that the enemy here is, La is Islamic State, and that the Turkish government needs to work with the Kurdish fighters against Islamic State. Mark, thanks for the update from the border there. Do stay with us here on BBC World News. Still to come, signed, sealed and delivered after months of bitter disputes, a new president has sworn in at the palace in Afghanistan. A gay pride march has taken place in the Serbian capital, Belgrade, for the first time in four years. Riot police were out in force. They blocked traffic on the route because of there had been threats of attacks from extreme nationalists. Guy Delaunay has more from Belgrade. Plenty of parties need security, but not perhaps to this level. Even the Prime Minister's brother found to his cost there was no way through the police cordon without correct accreditation. The organisers of Belgrade Pride said that 7,000 officers were on duty for this year's event, the first time it's gone ahead since 2010. That parade ended in chaos as hooligans attacked the marchers. Since then, the authorities have prevented Pride going ahead on safety grounds until now. The attendance was in the hundreds rather than thousands, but for the participants, there was a feeling that attitudes in Serbia might be starting to change. This is similar to what we had in 2010, with a big police presence on our streets. A lot has changed in the last five years. Leading politicians, including several government ministers, took part in the parade. They were keen to show that Serbia could be tolerant, as their country negotiates to join the European Union. We have a great opportunity to send a powerful message and picture to everyone that Belgrade is an open city. Many remain to be convinced. Anti-Pride protesters made their feelings known, despite the close attention of the police. But there were no major incidents, and with this year's Pride judged a success, the hope is that future events will be able to scale back the security. Guy Delaunay, BBC News, Belgrade.